Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold, and I was looking up the definition for traditions, and it said the handing down of information, beliefs, and customs by word of mouth or by example from one generation to another without written instruction. And we're getting to this wonderful season of Thanksgiving and Christmas, and if you're a fan of Christmas like I am, you probably have a whole time capsule of memories in your head. You all you need is the, the, the a song that comes on the radio, or you see uh, the, you, you see a, a package being wrapped on TV, or you smell cinnamon, or something triggers a whole lifetime of memories when it comes to Christmas, and they're all stored in your head, and it doesn't take much to get them out. And we're going to talk today about traditions as we start moving into this in, incredible and wonderful season of the holidays. And my guest today is Dr. Bob Moeller. He's host of the nationally broadcast weekly television pro, uh, show called Marriage for Better, for Worse on the Total Living Network. The show is in his 18th year. And he's nice enough to take my calls and come on the show. He also uh, conducts one-day marriage conferences across the U.S. and overseas. He's the author of eight books on marriage, and he wouldn't consider doing any of this important ministry without his wife, Cheryl. And that proves he's a very smart man. Bob, welcome. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, I, I'm I already getting excited for the holiday we have this week and the Christmas coming up. And and it is, I think, one of the greatest time capsules that live in people's heads is their own personal Christmas traditions and how they pass them on. I think so. Um, tradition is so important to us. I, I think it's important to our uh, uh, emotional welfare to have continuity in our lives. It can be uh, physically important to us to have certain traditions that um, keep us uh, alert and alive and uh, anticipating things. And then, of course, spiritually, traditions are very important as they begin to build into our lives uh, a certain bedrock of faith. And so, yeah, the traditions uh, are very, very important. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to ask uh, the audience uh, to share a tradition with us today. If you have a tradition, you can almost fill in the blank. I couldn't do the Christmas season without, because it's a tradition of yours. We'd love to hear what it is. 877-933-2484. Again, 877-933-2484. All right, Bob, let's, let's start start talking about some of the, the symbols of Christmas because I they're so powerful and I think it's always a good reminder to let people know that that they're important. Well, I have an acronym acronym, excuse me, I'd like to give the listeners this afternoon about Christmas and how to make it more meaningful, particularly as it has to do with uh, traditions. It's star. You know, we talk about the Christmas star that appeared in the East and led the wise men. Uh, star can stand for S for symbols of Christmas, P for traditions, A for activities, and R for reaching out. And in fact, uh, one of the earliest prophecies about the coming of Christ was found in the Old Testament in the book of Numbers, chapter 24, verse 17. A star will come from Jacob, and a scepter will arise from Israel. Uh, in fact, the whole verse says, I see him, but not now. I perceive him, but not near. It was amazing. Even a thousand years or more before Christ, um, this prophecy that a star would arise uh, was given. And so star is a useful way for us thinking about uh, Christmas and uh, making it more meaningful. Uh, symbols are very important, and they're important in the Bible. Let me read to you from Deuteronomy 6, 7 through 9. And it was talking about teaching 
uh, the children the commandments of the Lord and the law of the Lord, the word of God. And it says this, repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. So the Old Testament, the scriptures endorse the use of symbols. Of course, we don't worship them. Um, we don't make them an idol. But the symbols can speak to us of deeper spiritual truth. And I did some research on uh, common Christmas symbols. And what I found was a lot of them that we have today have a, a, a pagan past to them in one sense. They were used at a different time and culture, pre-Christian in some countries. But once Christianity came to that culture, came to that land, and its transformational effect of the gospel, symbols were given new meaning. And in fact, we can think of the cross, can't we? Uh, a symbol, a barbaric symbol of, 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 of crucifixion uh, under the Romans, but today, obviously, uh, very precious to us as believers. Well, these aren't on the same par, but again, symbols can speak to our hearts and remind us, <coughs> excuse me, of spiritual truths. Let's just take the Christmas tree. Obviously, one of the most um, uh, common symbols of Christmas is many people have them. And I know there are people listening who may object to their use. And, and I honor uh, their concerns about it because it definitely does have a, a pre-Christian past to it. But Christians, for Christians, um, the evergreen came to symbolize eternal life because it's green all year long. And the tree came to represent eternal life that Jesus offers. By the 16th century, Germans had embraced the tradition of bringing trees into their home during December, decorating them with candles, as one author uh, tells us. The tradition spread across Europe, then later to America. Well, I just want us the next time we look at a Christmas tree, whether in a store or even in our corner of our own home, to remember it represents eternal life, that in Christ he came to give us life that would not end. It begins now, and it goes into the future. In fact, there's an aspect of eternal life that goes into our past that we can embrace. But it's a wonderful time to thank God that Jesus came to give us eternal life. Um, let me give another one that's kind of, well, again, uh, you could look at it a number of ways, but candy canes. Um, the origin of candy canes, according to one author, is rather murky. Um, but according to some one popular tale, they were shaped like shepherd's crooks, representing the shepherds who visited the baby Jesus. The red and white stripes have been interpreted in various ways, but some believe the white represents purity and the red the symbol of the blood of Christ. I don't know anything that would remind me again of Jesus coming into the world, sinless, uh, a child of uh, purity, uh, a life without transgression, and his blood offered to cover our sins for our transgressions. Uh, that may seem a little bit of a stretch from a candy cane, but yet that is perhaps how they evolved, and what they meant to people at another time. I'll just give one or two more, and we'll move on to others. The Christmas wreath, again, or originating in pagan traditions, uh, made up of evergreen branches, but with the spread of Christianity, its circular shape came to represent eternity and the never-ending love of God. It came to symbolize eternal life and Christ's victory over death. And I think to look at a Christmas wreath and think, wait a minute, this in one sense can represent the never ending love of God for us, which of course motivated Christ to come to earth, that we can stop and thank him, that his love was so great, he gave up the riches of heaven for the rags and the poverty of earth in order to redeem us. One more, and that is the uh, poinsettia. I've never been a big flower fan of Christmas, but yet you see them decorating the front of churches and many other places. It's native to Mexico, 
And it's often called the Christmas star because of the star-shaped leaf. Um, legend says a poor Mexican child with no gift for the baby Jesus at a Christmas Eve service offered weeds that miraculously turned into bright red points. That is not obviously legend. But it mm -hmm. symbolizes the idea that any gift given in love is valuable. And the bright red color reminds many of the sacrifice of Jesus. Joel Poinsett, the first U.S. ambassador to Mexico in the 1820s, introduced them to the U.S. And so again, I did, Poinsett. I, mean, I did not know uh, that, Bob Mueller. Love. Yeah. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Joel Poinsett. Boy, who knew? <laughs> who knew? <laughs> yeah. So those are some what of about, the symbols that mean, mean well, something. I, I, I like that. I've got a couple floating in my head. Do you know anything about Christmas candles? Well, yes. Uh, they had deep ties to the holiday, representing, symbolizing the light and the darkness and the presence of Jesus. They're referred to as the light of the world. Historically, during winter solstice, that's the shortest day of the year, many cultures lit candles to brighten the longest night of the year and to pray for the return of longer days. As Christianity spread, this author says, the tradition was incorporated into Christmas celebrations, reflecting the arrival of Jesus, bringing spiritual light into the world. And indeed, um, when we think of the fact that the Bible says we were alienated without hope and without God, living in spiritual darkness until the light of the world appeared. And that candle can remind us again how Jesus came uh, to bring the light of salvation, the light of the gospel, to a world lost in sin and separated from God. I think that can make it uh, very, very meaningful. Mm -hmm. Bob, is there any connection to the Christmas and bells that are played in church? Well, yes. As a matter of fact, there are. Traditionally, on Christmas Eve, churches used bells to signal the beginning of the service to let people know it was time to celebrate. The author says, bells also connect to the tale of the Magi, the three wise men, symbolizing their announcement to visit the baby Jesus. As years passed, the ringing of bells became a recognized sound of the holidays. Now they're a key element of Christmas music and other celebrations. You know, Bill, something fascinating about the Magi. They came from Persia. That'd be modern day Iran. Uh, mm -hmm. God has had his hand on Iran for a long time, and he still does. He's not done. Um, but the Magi, how did they know to follow a star to Bethlehem? Because, well, in their land, they, 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 they had a religion called Zoroastrianism and other things which were pagan. Most scholars believe that the reason the Magi came was Daniel, who had lived much earlier, hundred centuries earlier, and had told them, you know, the book of Daniel talks about uh, uh, the coming of, of Christ and the, even the end times. And he had such an influence on that culture that centuries after his death, they were still looking for this uh, promised Messiah from Israel. So you can thank Daniel for the uh, Magi who arrived and the bells are a symbol of their arrival. Mm -hmm. We've got a couple of minutes before we're going to go to our first break. But before we do that, I, I had one more thing pop in my, my head that is really essential to the thoughts of Christmas, and, and that would be angels. Well, yes, angels. Um, angels are a very, very important part of our Christmas tradition. And uh, maybe you dressed up as one. In your church. I don't remember doing church. that. But yeah. <laughs> right. Several of the kids, when I was young, that were dressed as angels may have been miscast. Um, at least uh, it wasn't quite uh, uh, consistent with how they lived otherwise. Anyway, angels. Uh, the angel Gabriel announces to Mary that she would conceive a child. Angels heralded Jesus' birth to the shepherd, bringing tidings of joy. Uh, because of these roles, they're included in nativity scenes and placed on the top of Christmas trees, symbolizing the message of hope and joy that they brought. Their presence in Christmas celebrations, according to one author, highlights themes of divine intervention, joy, and the heralding of significant news. 
So whenever we see the angel, we need to remember God intervened. He broke into history. He broke up from the, from the spiritual world into the physical world. And they announced the birth of Christ to the most unlikely group in all of Jewish society, which was the shepherds. Uh, shepherds mm. were scorned. Uh, their, their testimony wasn't even uh, allowed in a court of law. They were considered so unreliable. And that's who the angels told the good news to. So good. Dr. Bob Moeller is my guest. We're going to continue talking about traditions. And if you uh, have one that you would love to share, you, you look forward to doing it every year. And it's part of how you think uh, about Christmas. I'd love for you to share it with us. 877-933-2484. We'll be right back. Well, your generosity is a living testament to your love for God and priority to advance the gospel. Thank you again for your tireless commitment to stepping up and blessing Faith Radio. As we head towards the holidays on December 3rd, we will celebrate with a single-day winter fundraiser. Thank you for your generous prayers and support. And if you'd like to get things done early, and who doesn't, you don't have to wait. Learn more about supporting Faith Radio at MyFaithRadio.com. I'm back with Dr. Bob Muller. Today we're talking about preserving Christmas traditions. We're getting that in our heads as we start moving into that beautiful and wonderful season of of the year. And Bob has given us a nice little um, acrostic uh, star, symbols, traditions, activities, and reaching out. And we just talked about some symbols and what a great reminder as we possibly put items up in our home, maybe a tree or a wreath or some candles we can have a context that we can be reminded of and even share with others what it means because it is so meaningful once we know what the uh, history is on it. All right, Bob, let's uh, move into the tea, which is uh, traditions. And we're going to talk a little bit about some wonderful uh, traditions. And you talk about Second Thessalonians 1.15 that says, So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold to the traditions you were taught whether by what we said or what we wrote. Say more about that. Well, yes, traditions are, again, scriptural, um, and they are important for us, and they're important to pass on to our children and our, our children's children. You know, Bill, I think of all the holidays of the year, um, Christmas is the one that transcends the generations. Um, we want to know how our grandparents celebrated or our parents or what we did. And we want to pass on things that are particularly meaningful to them that enrich the meaning of the season. And so um, I put together a list based again on some research of different traditions that we could incorporate into our Christmas um, celebrations. And one that I really strongly urge. Hey, Bob, before yeah. we go there, can I just ask a question? Do you remember a tradition that you heard that your parents had or your grandparents had that you can't forget? You still have it? Well, in your head? yes, <laughs> because it was one you could eat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, we'll get to that it's later. It's one then. you could smell. Uh, yeah, we could talk about that. But one of the traditions in our family, um, we come from, on my mother's side, a Scandinavian heritage that goes back uh, several hundred years. Um, was the making of what was called krumkaka, you know, crumb cake, or um, a Christmas cake, which was really some of the most delicious caramel rolls you've ever tasted, twisted in a wreath um, and hot out of the oven. We're talking butter, brown sugar, heavy cream, lots of cinnamon, yeast rolls, and the smell of that takes me back generations to my grandmother's farmhouse and and beyond that. And so it was, you know, certain foods that were made at Christmas time. I had a chance to visit Sweden, actually, when I was in college during January and Christmas had just passed. But a, a Swedish family took us in individually. I was with them for a day or two. And they showed me what they ate for Christmas that went back. And honestly, they saved 
the grease drippings from ham, roast beef, whatever, chicken. And then they would get all these drippings and then they would dip a piece of bread in it. I mean, submerge in it. And then you would cover it up with a knife and eat it. Now, <laughs> I'm not sure what they did to cholesterol. I'm not mm. sure how anybody lived past 35, you know, um, eating that way. But they said it was a Christmas tradition and had gone on. Sounds percentage. yummy. Yeah. yeah it was. All right. What are, what are some traditions that you learned about that you can share? Well, one of the ones that we now use in, in our ministry, we send out Advent calendars. And an Advent calendar is simply, oh, it can be, be quite simple, but it has usually made a cardboard and you open up one door tab each day and there's a verse of scripture. And each verse is related to Christmas in some way. So beginning December 1st through each day of the month of December, you open open and read the verse that it contains. And then you can discuss with your husband, your wife, with your friends, your family, what this means and how it relates to our lives today. And I think just each day going through an Advent calendar, having the Word of God in some way available to us um, to ponder and to discuss, I think it's just very meaningful. And it's just a great way to go through and um, uh, remember the year. In fact, I am just opening, let's see, today's on the Advent calendar, we will open this and it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, Luke 4, 18, that Jesus came in regard and was prophesied and the spirit of the Lord was there to reach uh, people with the good news and uh, with broken hearts to deal with our sin and pain. Anyway, I think it's a great idea. You can do it with small kids, older kids. You can do it as a family. Get an Advent calendar. Mm-hmm. Um, the next Advent one, starts th- this Sunday by, as, as well, by the way. December 1st is coming up this Sunday. Sooner than we can believe, right? Um, yeah, no yeah, kidding. This, this Sunday is the first one. Still time to go out and get an Advent calendar. Let me just that's say that's point. a wonderful tradition. Yeah, please do. Uh, the next one is a tradition that maybe you would start this year that you could pass on. And, well, it's been part of families, calling your family and friends in the Christmas season. But let me just add, not to just say hello and, you know, talk about, you know, this year's soccer league or whatever, but um, your kids Facebooking, whatever, but but calling someone and telling them how important they are to you. I mean, when's the last time we really said that? To call family, friends, others who mean a great deal. Yeah, it's nice to send a Christmas card. But what about calling them and saying, I don't know, this time of the year, I want to tell you how much your friendship means to me. I want to tell you as my child, my son, my daughter, my grand, how how blessed I am, how proud of you I am and who you've become. You know, Bill, why do we wait till funerals to say all the nice things about people? Uh, good point. <laughs> I mean, uh, they can't hear it. And uh, why not say it now? And Christmas is a wonderful time to call people and tell them just how important they are to you. And if you're going to send a Christmas card, send a heartfelt Christmas card, not just signing your name. But here's again, and I don't mean to sound morbid at all. This is meant to be joyful. But but think of if this was the last card they were ever to receive from you, what would you want it to say? If you knew either <laughs> their life or your life or whatever, what would be you want to say in this last card to someone? I give that advice for married couples. Uh, you should treat each day as if it's the first day of your marriage, the best day of your marriage, and the last day of your marriage. And if you look at each day, you'll probably say and do the right things. Well, sending that card, if this was one message that you wouldn't get a chance perhaps again to send, and I'm sure you will, what would you say? Mm-hmm. But if it's meaningful and heartfelt, I can almost guarantee, Bob, it's going to end up 
in a safe place and kept for years and years and years. Isn't that the truth? Yeah, it is. Um, it is. I just had a chance to visit my grandson in England and he's only three. And so his mom made a card for me and he just scribbled things and whatever. <laughs> I've got that on my desk. I know <laughs> you do. Not, I, you I, I could guess. Yes. <laughs> okay. Are we ready for another one? Sure. Love to. How about attending uh, a Christmas concert and more particularly the Messiah? Now, I realize this appeals more to adults than it might be to kids. It was first performed in 1767. And do you know it's been performed somewhere in the world every year since then? There has never been a year since 1767 where the Messiah has not been performed. I mean, Broadway, those shows may run 10 years. We're, we're pretty impressed with that, right? Or mm-hmm. a sitcom may go 15 years, you know, a Seinfeld or whatever. But what about a concert or a piece of music that has endured just short of 300 years? Uh, 270 years. And, you know, Handel wrote it in approximately two weeks, if that, that's what's so hard to believe. And he mm-hmm. came down from an addict or wherever he was and he said i have seen all the angels in heaven um god spoke to him and of course the tradition when the the chorus in handel's chorus of the messiah is played king of kings lord of lords um the queen of england the first time it was uh played for her and that's where originally it was she stood and from that time onward People stand when we get to the Messiah. And that still sends chills down my back. Yeah, me too. Um, whenever you stand and think about he shall reign forever and ever. Um, King of Kings. So take in the Messiah. It's so timeless. It's, it's power and beauty is almost unmatched in music. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it, it will make the season for you. And if you can't get to a concert, at least play it loudly in your house. Yes, on YouTube. <laughs> There's yes, several exactly. traditions. Uh, I spend uh, many a day during the year when I'm studying or writing, I've got the Messiah on. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the, um, and it just continues to reach my heart. Um, another idea in terms of tradition is to decorate your tree or begin that or your home the same day each year that is on the calendar, but each year add a new decoration to it. Uh, A family gave me that idea where every year they would buy a new Christmas ornament. And it wasn't to see which one could sparkle or glitter the most or outdo. It was always meant to coincide with something that year that was meaningful or that they were thankful for. Might've been the birth of a new child into the family. Uh, it might have been um, someone graduating. It might have been getting married, you know, whatever it might be. But think of this. If you start doing this this year, regardless of what age or your station in life, as the years accumulate, each time you put on that ornament, hang it up or whatever, there will be a story to tell. There will be a memory to share. Oh, this was the year God answered our prayer and, you know, we were healed of something Mm -hmm. or that, um, you know, something occurred. This was the year that our um, our child received Christ or whatever. Just it's just such a wonderful way that each time you look at your home at Christmas, each year will have a particular meaning Mm. uh, as you choose. I always. I always buy a new one to replace the one I broke, putting it away in January. <laughs> yeah. That's usually what I do. Well, you all know, right, you box on another one in the garage and you all of a sudden you hear several things break. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Oh, no, Good. That's the Christmas decoration. And I'm just wondering, take- Bill, have you, ever, have you ever gotten those twinkly lights to work more than one year? You know, the ones on the green string? Uh, you, Yeah, I usually get them to work in a year but usually they don't show up the next year and work so it's they're kind of a one and done thing yeah Yeah, they are yeah yeah 
Let me take a break, Bob Mueller. Uh, you can go learn more about Bob at fourkeepsministries.com. We're talking today about preserving Christmas traditions. What a wonderful uh, time of the year as we're moving into. We'd love your input. If you have a tradition you'd love to share, let me know what it is. 877-933-2484. My guest today is Dr. Bob Moeller. We're talking today about preserving Christmas traditions, how important it is that we pass on certain traditions uh, throughout our family and our, our, our lineage, and we can continue to uh, celebrate and enjoy things that we've done in our past and hopefully will be done in our future. You know, Bob, I, I've heard people be critical of the Christmas season. It's over-commercialized, which, of course, it can be. Uh, it's also an opportunity where... It's on the table for 25, 30 days where commercials are on TV, trees are in people's uh, front picture windows, uh, cards are being sent, parties are happening. We have a long time to use it as an evangelistic tool as for the real true meaning of Christmas and to start conversations with people. Absolutely. Yeah, I, there's no season of the year, I think, more universally recognized, even by non-Christians, as special, as joyous to look forward to, as Christmas is. So mm-hmm. that's not that's not a big stretch to uh, go from the discussion of Christmas and what you like most to its, its true meaning. Mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit about how we can take full advantage of that that month where we're uh, having opportunities to share the joy, share some cheer, uh, get a conversation going, and all the different ways in which we can uh, help people connect in loving ways and be honoring and celebrating our Savior. Yeah, well, um, you know, just a, a, a few ideas about uh, reaching out to people um, during this season as part of our activities and part of what we want to do. Um, Let me read something from Scripture that I think we should remember. Jesus said, he he was attending a a banquet or a meal. He He also said to the one who invited him, when you give a lunch or dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, your rich neighbors, because they might invite you back and you would be repaid. On the contrary, when you host a banquet, Invite uh, those who are poor, maimed, lame, or blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous, Luke 14, 12 to 14. Bill, there's a unique opportunity in the Christmas season to do things that can impact other people in a way that um, may, may really prove to be life-changing. And let me just start by saying, what if you host a holiday meal in the spirit of what Jesus just said for the lonely, the forgotten, and another category, the difficult? (laughs) People are just playing difficult, and because of that, maybe people shy away from them, or they are left alone, sort of the the modern-day Scrooges of of perhaps uh, people that you know. You know, years ago, Uh, Cheryl and I hosted a Thanksgiving uh, day because we have a a great love for singles, for older singles in particular. We've had a ministry called MSG to them for 15 years. We still meet monthly, even online. And one year we hosted a Thanksgiving uh, dinner for our single friends. And we were planning, you know, for 20 or 30 or 40 we had 150 people make reservations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we had we got someone to sponsor it through Cracker Barrel. Not in a commercial endorsement, but uh, they catered the meal. It was Thanksgiving with all the, the trimmings. And what, it was the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. What a memorable night that was. To have 150 people in a holiday meal 
sharing, feeling very much wanted, loved, included. And uh, the celebration was great. If I remember, we showed a, a film or a documentary on the Christian origins of Thanksgiving and the Puritans and what that meant and how important it was to the history of our country. But you don't have to have 150 people over. But what about a holiday meal for the widowed, uh, for the divorced, for the um, person who's been ill chronically all year, uh, for those who've just lost somebody, um, and bring the cheer, the joy of holiday meal together. I can tell you from our experience, you will be more blessed than anybody you bless. Mm. Um, so the joy, you, <laughs> whatever, will be much more. So you're, you pretty much, you and Cheryl said, here, here we are, Lord, use us. And you thought 20 and 150 showed up. So I love the step of faith you took. Bob, let's talk a little bit about those who are facing these holidays. Uh, one of our colleagues at Faith Radio just lost her dad last week, and I'm going to a funeral this Saturday for a friend of mine who lost his dad. So there's going to be an empty chair at mm -hmm. uh, many, many tables this year, and there's going to be a, a new level of pain and a new level of of loss and mourning. How's the what, how, What's the best way to, to get through that time? Well, the most natural instinct is to isolate ourselves. If we've been through that time of grief or loss, uh, you know, to be alone because we just are are caught in our grief and our sorrow. And I know what that feels like. Lost both my parents, and um, it's a very very difficult season. But we need to do the opposite of what we're feeling like doing. We want to be alone. We just don't want to see anyone. We Whatever. But that's a time when we intentionally still need to attend worship, still need to attend a Christmas service, still need, if we can, to go through with the traditions, you know, of meeting maybe with relatives or others and not isolate ourselves. Um, Bill, I was, I'm convinced from being a pastor for most of my adult life that the most important ministry to a grieving person is presence. Not, not Christmas presence with a bow, your presence. Mm -hmm. And just sitting, just being with them. You don't have to have the right thing to say. You don't even have to have the right scripture, as vital as that can be. But there is a time just for silence, where you sit with people, maybe, uh, you know, for the most difficult of the year, they might be Christmas or Christmas Eve or something like that. You invite them over or you go over and you just spend part of the day sitting with them and listening to their grief when they want to talk about it and remembering what they want to. You know, uh, it was a great load off my shoulder as a pastor to know that I didn't have to know what to say. I just had to be there. And sometimes silence is more eloquent, but particularly at the Christmas season, if there's going to be an empty chair, let those who love you, love you. Let those who care, care about you. Um, resist the urge to push them away. And if you need to cry in front of them, if you need to grieve, that's, 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 please do. That's what friends are for. Um, can I tell you a very quick story? I know time is short for us. No, we're good. Uh, one year, um, my birthday, which is in February, got postponed just because of activities in our family. It actually got postponed two months <laughs> from February 27th to, to March. Okay, so we had all our friends over, close friends. We had a number of them for my birthday celebration. In the middle of it, the phone rings, and it's my sister. And the minute I pick up, I can hear from her voice something is very wrong. And she says, if you want to say goodbye to Dad, do it right now. We're in the emergency room. He is succumbing to a heart attack. He's come back a couple of times, but he's not expected to live. I'll put the phone up to his ear. And so I had just a few moments to say goodbye to my father, whom I love so much. And then I had to hang up. Well, everybody's at this party. 
and looking at me and they can tell from my face, wait a minute here, something's not right. And I turned around and I simply told them that what has happened. Bill, you know what they did? That party turned into a prayer meeting. And mm. all my friends gathered around me, put their hands on me and Cheryl and prayed for us. I don't know a more meaningful get together I've ever had. And God knew that night that what was a party would would turn into a session where we were we were grieving, weeping with those who weep. But you know, I'm so ever thankful that they all were there. God's timing was perfect. Nobody had the right words to say and nobody whatever. They just loved me, let me cry, held me, Cheryl and I, and uh, that's what I want to encourage. If you know somebody who's been through that, don't, because of the awkwardness or whatever, don't shy away from them. Just the opposite. Just go and be with them, and they will forever be grateful. Hmm. Dr. Bob Moeller is my guest. We're going to take a break, come back, and continue our discussion on preserving Christmas traditions if you've got a tradition you'd like to share, we'd love to hear it. 877-933-2484. We'll be right back. It is my deepest desire that you take the very first step of faith by placing your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If you've got questions about what it means to begin a relationship with Jesus, text the word FAITH to 41224. My guest is Dr. Bob Moeller. We're continuing our lovely discussion on preserving Christmas traditions. I'm sure you have many, and I'm sure you enjoy them year after year, and I know you probably have passed them on, and that's a good thing. So, Bob, I, again, I want to remind everyone how great it is to take advantage of the full month of December when— yes. Uh, spirituality is on the minds of many. It's Christmas and Easter that a lot of people, their spiritual antenna go up a little bit and they think, huh, uh, remind me again of what this is all about and why your family gets so excited about it and why you do what you do and all these traditions you have. Why are you so excited? And you can say, I'll tell you why. Absolutely. That is, me- that's because of Jesus Christ. Yeah, and that's one of my suggestions And under the reaching out. Uh, remember our STAR acronym, Symbols, Tradition, Activities, and Reaching Out. And what about making um, a decision uh, to share Christ with someone each day of December? Lord, if you open up the opportunity, uh, what if each day I could have uh, an opportunity to present the gospel in some form, partially, completely, whatever, the moment allows to someone and tell them of the, the true wonderful news of, of Jesus. Uh, Dwight L. Moody, once a great evangelist from Chicago, once made a, a resolution that he would not go to sleep till he had shared Jesus with someone that day. Wow. And he told the story one night he was in bed and, you know, the pillow felt good and comfort, you know, the blanket snuggled around him and he realized he had not shared Christ. He got up got dressed, went out in the street and stopped somebody and led them to Christ. So I don't know. I'm just, it's just an idea. I would say maybe, maybe you could just be planting a seed every day in December. Maybe you make a point of saying to the cashier instead of, thank you, have a nice day. God bless you this day where you're just Mm -hmm. planting little seeds. So you may not have an opportunity to have a sit down and, and assure the entire gospel with someone, but make a contribution in their faith journey, even if it's just by a simple blessing. And, you know, I'm a big fan of continuing to say Merry Christmas to people as As opposed to Happy Holidays or or something else. So, you know, vanilla-like, but to say Merry Christmas. And um, if you have the opportunity to take a step further um, to say, isn't it wonderful that God so loved the world and go on from there. Like you say, just plant a seed. Mm -hmm. Um, A couple other things I might recommend, uh, you know, Operation Christmas Child, uh, Samaritan's Purse does this each year, gives gifts to the children of incarcerated 
individuals. And these children would not otherwise receive a Christmas gift in most cases because a parent, mother, or father is in, in prison, sometimes both. And just a way to reach out and to bless a child's life um, at Christmas time might be a very special way. I think uh, that may have started, maybe that was Prison Fellowship who started that. It's Prison Fellowship. That, mm -hmm. Yeah, but that. Another idea, send a special monetary gift to a missionary. Uh, do a missionary Christmas where you set aside something you might have spent on coffee for a week or something else, but send that gift through your church or directly to missionaries overseas who are serving away from home, away from family, that would allow them to have a, a better Christmas. Just one way of remembering that. How about bringing uh, the police and fire department a catered Christmas meal? Hmm. Uh, I, I've been part of churches that have done that, and I can't tell you how appreciative uh, the men and women of our law enforcement and fire department rescue teams, you know, they're working 24-7. They have to work through Christmas because people get sick and have accidents and fires start all year long. But what about deciding with some friends and call the station first and say, could we bring you Christmas mm. dinner? Or we bring you a lunch or could we do this just to say thank you to you? And it could be three days before Christmas. It might just be a, a Christmas gesture because I, I would guarantee that they would be very appreciative. Absolutely. And again, visiting a nursing home, a veterans hospital, a, a children's ward, bringing cookies, candy, um, cards, small gifts. Um, we we had a firsthand experience with this, that Cheryl's sister, who had cerebral palsy, um, was in a nursing home or facility like that for most of her adult life. And we were there once when families came by at Christmas season and they had made cookies. The kids had done, you know, help bake them. They brought, you know, small gifts and went to each room in that facility and gave each person there, you know, something Christmas-like to put in there, whether it was an ornament or cookies or something like that. And Bill, we knew people in that facility who had not had a visitor all year long. Wow. Mm. No one had come all year to see them. So when these people showed up, it wasn't just kind of, well, that's nice, or thank you for thinking about us. This was the first visitor they had had. And that's something small children, teenagers, anybody can be part of that. They will all be welcome. Mm -hmm. Bob, we just have about a minute left. So one of the things we have to be mindful of is keeping our pace at a level where we can create margin to do these kinds of things. Most of the time, people will wear themselves right to the bone right up till Christmas day. You know, that's so, uh, so very important that we do have margin in our life. Um, activity is not by itself meaningful. <laughs> you know, in other words, just cause you're busy doesn't mean that this is either important or that this is particularly meaningful. Um, and I think we need to create a, uh, many of us are living in negative margin where our loads are exceeding our limits. And so I've given a lot of ideas. We can't do all of these. Um, mm -hmm. It's just like Proverbs 31 is not something for a woman to attempt every week, or, you know, it may, may be over a year or several years, but choose something out of the symbols, the tradition, the activities, reaching out, just choose a small handful of things and say, we're going to push the rush we're going to push the craziness, the noise aside, and these things we're going to accomplish because we want this to be meaningful. And I mm -hmm. think we have to choose to do that. Um, we either plan our calendars or our calendars plan us. Oh, well said. Bob, thank you so much for doing the show and have a wonderful holiday season. So glad to have you on board uh, and be a contributor to the show. I appreciate you. So thankful for you and your team as well. Merry so Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas to you, yeah. Dr. Bob Moeller has been my guest. Learn more about him at 4keepsministries.com. 
We've got a very special treat coming up in hour two. Faith Radio's Susie Larson's going to join me. Boy, she got an amazing hour planned. Don't go anywhere. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.